the Cookbook for Professional Growth to Support CTE Instruction. I'm Karen Bronson. And I'm Stephanie Stewart. And we're so glad you're able to join us today. We don't know if it's snowing where you are, but it's certainly snowing where we are. And it just keeps snowing, so it's a good day for a webinar. So welcome once again. We really look forward today to walking you through the Charlotte Danielson Framework for Teaching with a particular emphasis on connecting the domains and the components to CTE instruction. Um, I would just like to say that in all of the work that I have done around the Charlotte Danielson rubric over the past couple of years, I think that uh, the more I become familiar with the framework itself and with CTE instruction, the more clearly we really see what a good fit it is between the Danielson Framework for Teaching and CTE instruction. So our hope is that you come away from this presentation with that sense too, that there really is great alignment, great fit, and really great opportunity uh, to define effective teaching using the Danielson rubric as a framework. I'll say too that this is not a common core presentation, but there's a real parallel because the more I and the more we learn about Common Core, the more we can see that there are really great opportunities to fit and align with CTE instruction. So uh, perhaps unlike three years ago when we really all started with this learning and we thought that primarily there'd be an emphasis on academics, the more we are all learning together, the more we're seeing not only is there a good fit with CTE instruction, but really CTE teaching and learning can provide us with really um, excellent examples and opportunities to further everyone's understanding of both the Danielson rubric and, you know, other big picture items like Common Core. So we hope you come away with that today, and mostly we hope you really enjoy this webinar. So Gretchen's going to... Um, share with us just a little bit of information from SPN. On behalf of the CTE Technical Assistance Center, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. A few technical points to cover before we begin. All attendees are initially muted. We will take comments and questions throughout the webinar. To pose a question, you can click the raise your hand icon and you will be announced and unmuted to ask your question. You may also submit a question to be addressed by typing it into the questions pane on the control panel. All questions are logged, and unanswered questions will be addressed by today's presenters via email. If you become disconnected, please call us at 518-723-2137. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the CTE Technical Assistance Center website at nyctecenter.org within 72 hours. If you have questions or suggestions regarding upcoming webinars, please contact the Technical Assistance Center at CTE at spnet.us. Thanks, Gretchen. We're really going to start today by taking a step back and really thinking about teaching as the art and the science that we all know and I I'm going to say probably love, whether we are st still teaching actively or whether we are administrators who were former teachers and are now teaching in a different way. I think we would all agree that teaching is certainly a complex and nuanced um, endeavor that really requires not only skills, but really nuanced expertise. So Lee Shulman in The Wisdom of Practice in 2004 has what we think was a really great quote about that. Um, Stephanie, could you read that for us, please? Sure. After 30 years of doing such work, I've concluded the classroom teaching is perhaps the most complex, most challenging, and most demanding subtle, nuanced, and frightening activity that our species has ever invented. The only time a physician could possibly encounter a situation comparable, of comparable complexity would be in the emergency room of a hospital during or after a natural disaster. Thank you. So I'm going to say that if we were all sitting in the same room together face to face right now, I would probably be seeing some smiles of recognition. I would probably ask a question um, in terms of which words in that quote resonated with you the most. And I'm going to just kind of harbor a bet that there'd be several. Words like challenging, demanding, complex, nuanced. 
that comparison, I think, uh, to an emergency room physician might be a little bit over the top, but I think we get the picture that we are really thinking on our feet all the time and thinking in a very complex way to bring all of the components together to something that means good instruction for students, good teaching and learning. So we're going to think about, as we get started too, what are the benefits of using a high quality rubric at all to evaluate performance? Why is the framework important? Um, if you think about your experience with an observation or evaluation process that did not use such a framework, I think that you would probably have some recollection similar to mine. If you have been in this um, occupation as an educator for more than three years, you probably have pretty good memories of an observation and evaluation system that really did not have a very specific rubric to, to ground it and to provide that framework. And probably uh, you would recall systems where you were evaluated as a teacher or when, where you went in as an administrator to evaluate teachers where perhaps there was not as much consistency as you or teachers would like Perhaps more of the um, finished product of evaluation came down to things like preferences of the observer or evaluator. And perhaps even within one school system or within one school building, two or three observer or evaluators had different outlooks and kind of personal philosophies, we've all got them, of what constitutes good teaching. So probably I think it's safe to say that um, when we think about the benefits of a high quality rubric, we're really trying to acknowledge that teaching is that complex and nuanced thing. And if we can come to a really great definition, a really great description, and a really great framework in terms of what is it that makes for highly effective, proficient, distinguished teaching and instruction, we really are building in both consistency, equity, and all other kinds of benefits to the evaluation system. Any framework for teaching, and as you well know, in New York State, the Danielson framework for teaching is not the only one. Uh, this is true of the NICET rubric and the other approved rubrics in New York State as well. All of them bring to this process lots of really good things. First of all, a common language that gets all of us speaking together about what constitutes good teaching in the same way. It brings development of shared understanding. What do we all believe and what do we all do the same way in the observation and evaluation process? Well, of course, one facet that you're all familiar with is the importance of evidence in the process. Once again, really contrasting to long, long ago and far, far away, grounding this whole process in true evidence that we'll take a look at a little bit more later is really key. So that's an example of a shared understanding. We really want teachers as professionals to become more comfortable with reflection and self-assessment. This is not at all a tool to build a gotcha model from. This is not um, a tool to only assess in terms of score points. This really is a guide and a cookbook as we kind of think of it more that way, that gives us the recipe, the ingredients, and the directions to get to a very high level of professional performance. And as some of you may be aware, Charlotte Danielson first intended this to be a reflective rather than an evaluative instrument. So um, that really is our focus today. How can we use the Danielson rubric as certainly an observation and evaluation instrument, which it is and which it has become, but really at its core, that cookbook for self-reflection and professional growth. Finally, we get those professional conversations around the shared language, shared understandings that give us much more clarity and much more focus as we talk about what constitutes high quality instruction. So all of these are really true benefits of this rubric and we can really see right now in schools where um, the Danielson framework now has been in use for several years that everyone, even though it could have been a rocky start at the get-go, everyone is really at a different place now in terms of this shared language and shared understanding.
We really also want to think about the observation process as just that. It really is a process. It's not an event. Uh, for the most part, we have both an announced and an unannounced observation each year. We have to have, of course, two full observations uh, minimum, although districts may negotiate their APPR so that the length and the nature of those observation times may look different in terms of what's negotiated. But if uh, a full period observation is announced, then of course there would be a pre-observation conference. There's always a post-observation conference. Whether the observation itself was announced or unannounced, there's a meeting between the teacher and the administrator at the conclusion of the observation conference to really have that all-important conversation around instruction. And these pre- and post-observation conferences are a primary opportunity for truly meaningful profession, professional conversations and reflection. I'm going to say that a really big area of learning right now is around these professional conversations. This is an area where all of us as educators, regardless of how long we've been doing this, how skilled we thought we were as observa obser observers and evaluators, we're really learning how to have high quality conversations around instruction in ways that are effective, actionable, and meaningful. That's not the topic of today's webinar, but I'm going to say that those professional conversations and feedback around instruction, those are really, really key pieces of learning to bring this process forward and continue to improve on um, our collaborative learning. So the evaluation system has two purposes, really. One of them, of course, is quality assurance, and that's where the 60-point um, multiple measure piece for the New York State APPR comes in. But once again, as Charlotte Danielson intended it, focus really on professional learning. How can we, as teachers, really continually uh, take a look at our classroom performance our success with students and continue to grow. That's right at the heart of the matter. So once again, I'm going to invite you to think about the Danielson Framework for Teaching as a cookbook. Once again, a cookbook for professional growth with the recipes, with the ingredients, with the directions for excellent instruction. Um, we didn't have this when I was growing up as a teacher, and we didn't have this when I was growing up as an administrator. So we were all kind of groping around for what is this thing? How do we do it? How do we define it the same way together? And now we have it. We have the cookbooks. And cookbooks can be pretty good places to start for some inspired products from the kitchen. So let's take a look. First of all, I think you're probably all very familiar now with the Danielson framework in terms of its structure. But let's just take a quick look, quick look through that structure and how the Danielson framework is actually organized. The four domains, uh, domain one being planning and preparation, domain two, the classroom environment, domain three, instruction, and domain four, professional responsibility. Right. And within those four domains, we find a total of 22 components, 76 elements, and four levels of proficiency, which at first, um, at our first earliest learning, that can seem overwhelming, but once again, the more we travel down the road together, the more familiar we get with the rubric, the more those domains, components, and elements really combine to help us make more sense in terms of this common definition for high quality instruction. If we look at the domains themselves, we can see that there are four of them. and I'm going to um, suggest that we think of them, as Charlotte Danielson describes them, as two off-stage domains and two on-stage domains. So I think that if we take a look at domains one, two, three, and four, and we think in terms of a context of on-stage and off-stage domains, we would agree that the on-stage domains are really in our second column classroom environment and instruction. Because we'll think of those on-stage domains as things that the observer evaluator, whether it's your colleague from down the hall or the principal, 
who's observing formally, things that any observer could see happening within the course of a period of instruction within your classroom. Okay? But we know that it doesn't all come together during that 40 minute or whatever period. Lots of work. We've really done most of the hard work before that bell rings to start the period because we've done tremendous planning and preparation, which is domain one. We've done that off stage behind the curtain for the most part. We've also um, done so many things that really are described as our professional responsibilities in domain four. And just kind of another um, observation that I'll share, when the Danielson rubric first came into use back in 27, before APPR, Race to the Top, ever hit, at first there was a sense that there was now a lot more, that it was really burdensome to have um, attention paid to those offstage pieces, to what we do before the bell rings at the beginning of the 40-minute period and when the bell rings at the end. But really, the kind of growing understanding is that this is great because everything that we as teachers, and I often really think like the teacher that I was for many years before I was the principal, so I, I, I think in that context, everything that we do as teachers that results in that excellent period of instruction um, happens because of the hard work that we do outside of the classroom in our planning and preparation of our lessons and what I'm going to call all that other stuff that we always do within the context of our responsibilities in our school that are our professional responsibilities. The good news is we always did it because we had to, to have that excellent period of instruction, but now it's validated in a really positive way. It's validated, it's acknowledged, and it is um, described so that we can also continue to grow in those two offstage domains. So once again, I would invite you to think of the four domains in terms of two offstage domains, domains one and four, and two onstage domains, domains two and three, classroom environment and instruction. And I'll say it's fair to say that today our focus is going to be more on domains two and three, the onstage domains, with a real respect for those underpinnings that take place in domains one and four. When we think about the Danielson rubric, if we had to boil down the big ticket items, the big ideas that resonate throughout the rubric, throughout all four domains, all components, all elements, what really matters here, what counts the most, what are the priorities, these are some of the things that we could identify as clearly um, stating what the priorities are in the Danielson framework for teaching. And as we start to think more in terms of CTE instruction, I'm really inviting you to think about what happens in CTE classrooms every day, and isn't it great how closely we can see the alignment and the connection between these priorities in the Danielson rubric and certainly what we have thought of all along as high quality CTE instruction. So if we had to identify these big ideas, we would certainly uh, think about things like a focus on learning first and foremost. And you know, I'm going to say that sometimes when we throw these phrases around, focus on learning, sometimes they sound deceptively simple. Well, OK, sure. Sure there's a focus on learning. It's all about learning. It's always been about learning. I'm going to say that a focus on learning is different from a focus on teaching. There's really a significant difference between focus on teaching and focus on learning. One of the biggest shifts, and really one of the deepest and most significant shifts that's occurred through the use of these rubrics on effective instruction is that now when uh, an observation is occurring, the eyes and the ears of the observer really are not focused solely on the teacher at the front of the room. In fact, we hope the teacher isn't stuck at the front of the room any longer because it's not so much anymore about what the teacher is saying and doing. It's really about, and if I could ask you now, you're all saying it out there in your kitchens or in your offices, who's it about, guys? It's really about, that's right, you got it. It's really about the students. 
It's really about the observer acknowledging what students are saying, what students are doing, and most importantly, evidence for what students are learning. How do we know what they're learning? How's the teacher assessing that? How is instruction being adjusted or modified based on what the teacher is learning in a dynamic way as instruction is taking place? So I think that first priority of focus on learning is deceptively simple. It really um, identifies a deep shift from a focus on teaching in the observation process to a focus on what students are learning. Cognitive engagement is absolutely key in Danielson rubric and, and in all of the other approved rubrics. The key word is cognitive. Engagement, as Charlotte Danielson would like to say, is not just hands-on, it's minds-on. Big difference. I could say that students are engaged in the word search that I gave them to do this period because I was, you know, kind of out of other ideas, but we're really not looking for kids to be engaged with the word search. We're not even looking for them just to be engaged with the manipulatives in a fifth grade math classroom. What we're looking at is for them to be cognitively engaged. We want to see and hear thinking on the part of students taking place, whether the subject is electronics or physics. We want to see evidence of student thinking. So I'm going to ask you to think about engagement in a way that really is uh, significantly deeper, once again, than how we might have thought of engagement several years ago. Engagement then might have meant students are busy, they are, quote, on task, they're all doing something, they're not throwing things around the room, they're not uh, just talking to each other about what they did last weekend, they're engaged. Okay, good, but we really want to see them engaged in terms of their thinking, and we want to see evidence that they're doing that. And there are lots of ways we can see that in the Danielson rubric. Um, we mentioned the importance of evidence now as observer and evaluators come into classrooms and as teachers self-assess. It's not so much a whimsical definition based on a personal preference. Uh, you know, one observer really likes to see um, the blinds all at the same length because that's evidence of skillful order and classroom management. And another observer really wants to see kids in straight rows with their hands up answering questions. But another observer really loves when kids work in groups and it's really all about what that observer likes and wants to see. This and, and the other approved rubrics take that whimsy and take that kind of observer bias out of the picture, which is really, I think, one of the greatest benefits um, for the process that we've all learned about. Certainly, I think if any of you could identify a top priority in Danielson, you would say it's certainly instruction that is more student-centered and less teacher-directed. More evidence, once again, of what students are saying and doing, how students are initiating instruction and supporting their own instruction, less teacher direction in the traditional sense of the word, but with firm teacher direction as the underpinning and foundational work. Ongoing assessment is essential, and we're going to take a deeper look today at what assessment actually means, how it's different from the test at the end of the unit. The test at the end of the unit is the test at the end of the unit. It's a summative assessment. It may be for the purpose of a grade, maybe for other purposes. We're going to focus more on this thing called assessment, which is not just another word for the test at the end of the unit. And finally, as we mentioned when we looked at the rubric in its entirety, there's truly now, and I think this is great news for good teachers, there's validation of that off-stage planning, validation of those many professional responsibilities that were always expectations but are now built into the fabric and certainly uh, built into the recipes in the cookbook. So those are pretty much what we would identify as the big ticket items, the big idea understandings in the Danielson framework for teaching. Certainly, um, as clearly linked with CTE instruction as with what we might think of as mother, other more academic subjects. Okay, so we have four performance levels, as I'm sure you know. Uh, ineffective, developing, effective, and highly effective in the New York State HEDI scoring, H-E-D-I. In Danielson, 
The words translate to unsatisfactory for ineffective, basic for developing, proficient for effective, and of course distinguished for highly effective. And why don't we just kind of get to this elephant in the room right now. Um, probably most of the uh, consternation, concern, agita, whatever you want to call it, really comes between proficient and distinguished. For the most part, and I'll just say that, you know, I've worked um, with the Danielson rubric since 27 in a school district that adopted it when it first came out, once again, before the era of APPR. And we really made a, kind of a fundamental error. We, and I say we, and I mean our very strong and very excellent Teachers Federation and our administrative uh, group, we all agreed that the best model out there was the Danielson Framework for Teaching. It was new then. It was highly respected. We adopted it, and then we started using it. We didn't do any professional development. We didn't spend a lot of time really reading it closely together and having conversations about it. And what we ended up with was a lot of thorniness and a lot of sticking points between proficient and distinguished as performance levels. General acknowledgments around unsatisfactory and basic, a lot less clarity around proficient and distinguished performance levels. So today we'll take another look at some key words that really help us distinguish those different performance levels, particularly the last two. If we look at the rubric itself, uh, we can see that, once again, what you see on your screen right now is an example of one component within a domain, the domain being classroom environment, the component being creating that environment of respect and rapport for students, along with um, elements around teacher interaction with students and student interactions with one another. So just visually, a sample that we're probably familiar with. So let's think about this all-important uh, but somewhat thorny sometimes definition of performance levels from unsatisfactory to basic to proficient to distinguished. If we comb through the Danielson rubric and extract or cull words that come up most frequently as general descriptors in all of the domains and all of the components and element examples if you're using 2011, we can really boil it down to the words in these columns. Reading these words together and just feeling the difference between these columns of words help us, and these can, you know, if you are um, an, a, an administrator, if you're an observer or evaluator, looking at these words and talking about them with your teachers can be a very helpful part of the process. So if we look at the most common words that describe unsatisfactory performance, um, Stephanie, can you just read down that column and let's just listen to what these words sound like. Sure. Unsafe, lack of, unaware, harmful, unclear, poor, unsuitable, or none. Right. So think about those words. Once again, I kind of put these in the we know it when we see it category. Think about CTE classrooms. Think about the tremendous priority on safety. If you, uh, as an observer, or if you, as a teacher in your own classroom, have a sense that uh, things like safety considerations, for example, are really to the point that students can be harmed because of a lack of procedures, we're in the land of unsatisfactory. And that carries over to every other domain and component, component around things like classroom management, around things like how teachers demonstrate care for students as well as things that are more concrete like classroom safety. So, but let's move up that ladder. Once again, let's look at these general, most common descriptors for basic. We're going to get warmer here. Stephanie? Partial, generally, inconsistently, attempts, awareness, moderate, minimal, thumb. Okay. So once again, you can feel the difference in, that, in, in the flavor of those words. Um, I often look at these words as words that many um, student teachers might be um, gravitating toward in terms of their emerging performance. They're making good attempts. They're learning a lot. They're trying some new things. The results might be partial or inconsistent, but there's a clear
clear attempt to be moving in a level of more proficient performance. There's awareness. There are some, uh, let's say, correct responses to classroom management issues that may occur, but it's spotty, but we're definitely getting warmer. Let's take a look now at words that describe proficient performance, which is really a high level of performance. Consistent, frequent, successful, appropriate, clear, positive, smooth, and most. Okay, so now we can definitely sense that our general descriptor words are coming into focus much more sharply. We're seeing a high level of performance. You can be thinking right now about CT CTE classrooms where you see consistent attention to perhaps uh, differentiated levels of learning among students, successful responses to teacher behavior, clear directions that help students with their learning, positive responses to uh, perhaps a student who's struggling with something. Those are words that really do define a high level of performance. They are wrapped into words that describe distinguished performance. Uh, and once again, distinguished is kind of, as Charlotte Danielson says, we visit there, we don't live there. I like the word aspirational for distinguished performance. Some teachers who have great uh, experience and effectiveness might be distinguished in some component areas. They would certainly have other component areas to identify as areas where they would like to move toward distinguished performance. So let's take a look at these words and we'll talk about what the difference is between distinguished and proficient. Seamless, solid, subtle, skillful, preventative, leadership, student, and always. Okay, so as we can see, the word student is highlighted in that last column. And that, of course, is because of the Danielson focus on student-centered learning. And basically, what we can see is that proficient words describe a high level of teacher-directed success. Distinguished describes a high level of student-directed success. And as we look at some examples, we're going to see how that looks and sounds in classrooms. That, because it's hard for teachers, particularly those who are used to a very teacher-directed classroom, to understand, much less start to implement strategies that get to a more student-centered kind of success. But there's definitely a different feeling to that. And that's what brings us up to proficient uh, excuse me, up to distinguished performance in the Danielson rubric for CTE instruction as well as for academic instruction. When we get back to our source of evidence for teaching, once again now, given the fact that we have probably been working with this rubric for a couple of years now, I think it's fair to say that we are all fairly familiar with um, what some of these sources of evidence are certainly the pre- and the post-observation process, as well as the actual observation, artifacts, things that we can actually look at for evidence are essential for domains one and four. And we've seen uh, curriculum mapping as a great opportunity for CTE instruction and a great resource, particularly in that planning component. We also are acknowledging that evidence of student learning is as critical as evidence of teacher words and actions in our process. So everything from how students are doing on locally developed assessments, student learning objectives, student performance in the actual CTE program, employability profiles that come from different components of a CTE program, all of those can help provide evidence for uh, student learning, which is an all-important piece of this process. It's sometimes helpful when we work with our teachers to increase their understanding of the domains that um, we define them differently. So for example, it's helpful to think of domain one as a domain where the teacher is in fact the designer, designing high quality instruction. Let's take a look at this quote from Wiggins and McTie. An essential act of our profession is to design curriculum and learning experiences to meet specified purposes. We are also designers of assessments to diagnose student needs, 
to guide our teaching and to enable us, our students, and others to determine whether our goals have been achieved. Okay, thank you. So we're going to ask teachers to think in designer mode in domain one as they do their planning and preparation, as they demonstrate their knowledge of resources, whether the course is for cosmetology or uh, you know, English 11, that knowledge of resources is essential, setting good, rigorous instructional outcomes, showing that we really know and understand our students. How critical is that uh, in any course of instruction, whether it's kindergarten or high school, CTE or math um, courses, that's critical in terms of the success that we're going to get with students, demonstrating not only that we know them, but we know them so that we can relate to them and have them know that we care for them and their learning. If we look at domain uh, one examples, some things that teachers uh, in CTE or academic classes alike might submit as some of, some of the good evidence pieces for domain one might include things like lesson and unit plans, evidence of familiarity with IEPs and other support uh, documentation for students with special needs, Evidence of collaboration with student support personnel, meeting with the guidance counselor, meeting with the school psychologist, meeting with the school nurse to have a greater understanding, perhaps, of who our students are. So we can look at these other examples as all uh, potentially good ones in that first domain. And as we mentioned, curriculum mapping can also be a great resource for CTE instruction. Curriculum mapping is key in connecting to the Danielson Professional Development Rubric. The rubric is grounded in evidence. Curriculum mapping is grounded in documenting evidence. CTE programs and curricula are student-centered, as is the Danielson Rubric. I'm sorry. Hold on. I'm getting my little mousey straight here. Here we go. There you go. Here we go. Thank you, Steph. <laughs> CTE curriculum mapping is a tool for using Danielson's model of professional development. It, it's a technique for exploring what is taught and how instruction occurs and when instruction is delivered, as you were talking about earlier in um, you know, the Danielson yeah. model and, and all about learning yeah. and not so much about teaching. Um, it's a process for collecting data that identifies core content, the processes and the assessments are used, that are used in the curriculum. Evidence of student learning can be chronicled through the use of curriculum mapping. Evidence of student learning can be crosswalked with the Danielson rubric and with elements of the cur curriculum mapping component. So as we learn more about uh, what some possible evidence pieces can be for domain one, we can see that curriculum mapping really has a lot of potential in this area, really fits well with CTE instruction, and pretty much um, could be just an excellent way to really map what I like to think of as the big four questions for learning. And these are questions that do fours, if you're familiar with professional learning communities, these are the big four do four questions. What are students supposed to be learning? How do we know if they're learning it? What are we going to do differently if they're not? And what are we going to do differently if they're not only learning it, but they're all over it, they're eating it up, they're devouring it, and they need more challenge? So you know, once again, I'm going to say curriculum mapping is not our sole focus today, but there's really great potential to use it as a great tool to shape CTE curriculum. It's certainly evidence in domain one. So as we move to domain two, we invite teachers to think of themselves as the architects. Um, we invite them to think of themselves working with students to build and maintain that safe, respectful, and not just safe and respectful, invigorating environment for learning. And we look at our classroom environment, and we consider the components there. Um, and let's take a look at what they are, five of them. Creating an environment of respect and rapport, establishing a culture for learning, managing classroom procedures, managing student behavior, and organizing the physical space. OK, so we want to come back to that all-important evidence piece. How do we know it when we see it? Well, 
here are some examples, and I would invite you, you know, take some time to uh, look at these examples and perhaps others from the 2011 Danielson framework, which contains a lot of great illustrative examples that are very helpful in people understanding particularly the difference between proficient and distinguished. But um, as we look at all of these examples, we see that all of them are perfectly relevant to CTE classrooms as well as any classrooms. Uh, let's take a look at the third bullet. Students, it's something subtle, but it's something important. We're observing that classroom, and a student, let's say a student who doesn't usually feel that comfortable raising his hand and participating does, and shares an idea. And that's always kind of going out on a limb and taking a risk. And there's kind of this reaction from other students like, oh, you know, kind of an eye roll and a tisk and a kind of snarky response to that student's idea. Okay? That's where the teacher comes in. Okay? Because if there's no response to that snarky response to the student's idea, then the message that all the students get is it's okay to do that in here. This is the culture of our classroom. We roll our eyes. We tisk tisk. We kind of disrespect someone else's idea. So that, of course, wouldn't signify very um, satisfactory or proficient um, response on the part of the teacher. Okay. On the other hand, if we look down at this bullet um, and there's some disrespectful talk occurring, teacher says, "Don't talk that way to your classmates. At least there's an attempt." you know, to kind of address that, the insult stop. We had some teacher direction there that showed awareness of the importance of stopping that kind of disrespectful behavior. But then we kind of look at this example right above it. Um, students themselves wait for classrooms to finish, classmates, excuse me, to finish speaking before beginning to talk. Students have a sense that something important is going on in the room and kind of shush um, those who are talking out of turn because we're going to miss something good if we don't because of classmates making a presentation. So those are some examples of um, 2A evidence statements that go from an unsatisfactory level, a lacking response, to a pretty high level of student initiation. If we look at domain two, we're going to think about looking now at some real world examples of these components. Uh, from CTE teachers in this domain around classroom environment. First of all, just remembering that proficient performance is described this way. There is little loss of instructional time due to effective classroom routines and procedures. With minimal guidance, students follow established classroom routines. While distinguished performance is described this way, Instructional time is maximized due to efficient classroom routines and procedures. Students contribute to the management of groups, transitions, and or the handling of materials and supplies. Okay, so if we look at some examples that were actually contributed by CTE teachers in this component, we see things like from a culinary arts teacher, for example, um, he has daily and weekly agendas on the whiteboard. From and a child development Teacher. Each week, a student is appointed lead and is in charge of directing groups and managing distribution of supplies. In an economics class, students pick index cards which direct them to randomly assign groups so that they're working with different classmates on a regular basis. And in landscaping, I create competitive work crews and rotate foremen to understand different pressures of various roles. The telecom teacher has seniors actually help and redirect juniors with class procedures and demonstrate the safe use and storage of power tools. And once again, if we want our teachers to have a better understanding of what this student initiation is, student ownership of learning, these are great ways to help people understand that. This is how it looks and sounds different. Right. And a health teacher shared that she or he has a designated spot in the room for the day's handouts and supplies for students to pick up on the way in. Okay. We can see, uh, once again, in terms of organizing physical space, there is a higher level of performance in terms of distinguished performance. And let's take a look at some examples. The childhood development teacher uh, uses a strategy of creating classroom tours and scavenger hunts 
at the beginning of the course to learn where materials are stored, and a forensic teacher. For a crime scene investigation lab, four scene stations are set up in four corners of the room, with chairs for each small group arranged around the material so students can think through the process beforehand and process their findings with minimal distractions from other teams. Here's what a graphics teacher had to say in terms of component 2E. Um, he shared that they practice transitioning from straight rows for direct instruction to oval or U-shaped um, formation in the room for discussion and to small clusters then for group work so that students can move desks within the period of instruction to create seating arrangements that support the goals of the activity. So here we see the way the furniture is arranged in the room makes sense for the learning outputs that we want and to bring it up to that distinguished level, it's not all teacher created. Students are very familiar with the routines. When teacher uh, needs to transition from one activity to another, students are active participants in kind of making the furniture, making the room fit the next goal of their learning within that lesson. In domain three, we ask the teacher to think of himself truly in that role of instructor. Uh, domain three is the heart of the framework for teaching. It describes the critical interactive work that teachers undertake when they bring complex content to life for their students. Before we delve into domain three, um, I think, Gretchen, that we might have a question at this point. Let's kind of field that question now rather than uh, waiting until the end. Do you want to share that with us? Sure. Um, this is in reference to an earlier slide. I believe it was slide 13. But the attendee asked, what would you hear from a student who is cognitively engaged? That's a great question. What would we hear from a student who is cognitively engaged? And I'm going to extend that a little bit. What would we see? from a student who is cognitively engaged. What does it look like? What does it sound like? Well, a student who is cognitively engaged might be asking a good question. That's one thing that we could hear from a student that's evidence of thinking. We can see that he or she is engaged in the topic of the lesson to a point that he or she is asking good questions to further learning. We could hear a student who's cognitively engaged responding to a classmate's um, sharing in terms of the topic of the lesson. And one thing we want to see our teachers doing is connecting student to student. So we'd see perhaps a comment that demonstrates under, understanding and support of a classmate's response. What could we see in terms of cognitive engagement? We could definitely see students who are focused on the whatever's occurring at the moment, the demonstration the um, activity that's taking place within their group. We're not seeing students just asking to get the bathroom pass. We're not seeing students with their head down on the desk. We're seeing eye contact student to student or student to teacher. And once again, we are hearing comments that are not only in response to teacher questions, but are actually initiating questions that shows evidence of um, engagement in the lesson. So I hope that's helpful. Are there any quest other questions right now before we move on? No, I'm not. OK. So we'll continue uh, with domain three, which is right at the heart of uh, instruction. Steph? Yep. Communicating with students. B, using questioning and discussion techniques. C, engaging students in learning. D, using assessment and instruction. And E, demonstrating flexibility and responsiveness. And I'm just going to say that we could spend our entire webinar time delving very, very deeply into this one domain around instruction. But for our purposes today, we want to at least get a good anchor and a good handle on how some of these components look in CTE classrooms. So we're thinking about, we're focusing on 3B, questioning and discussion, engaging students in learning, using assessment and instruction. Once again, let's get back to some examples, but before we do that, I think it's worth spending a few moments delving into assessment, what it means, and the all-important difference between formative assessment and summative assessment. 
formative assessment is very dynamic. It happens during teaching. It focuses on assessment for learning while learning is happening. And the purpose, the primary purpose of that assessment is to know. We remember our four big questions. What are students supposed to be learning? How do we know if they're learning it? This is where formative assessment lands. Do we know whether students are getting it? And therefore, what does that tell me or the teacher I need to do to instruct my instructional strategies? It's for me so that I can change things if I have evidence that they're actually not or a number of students are really not grasping the concept or if they are kind of way ahead of me, I need to adjust as well. That's really different from traditional summative assessment, which happens after teaching. It's an assessment of learning that's taken place rather than learning that's dynamically happening now. The purpose for that summative um, assessment is really to evaluate students' performance that's already happened, to make decisions about grades, course completion, graduation, all necessary, but very, very different. So we could think of that summative assessment, if we want to, as a kind of autopsy after the fact where we can think of formative assessment as kind of the well checkup while the learning is happening so that we can do things differently to enhance that learning. So that's really um, a critical piece for Danielson and a critical piece in CTE and all classrooms in terms of this understanding around, once again, these four questions that acknowledge that learning is a dynamic process that we have to continually assess. We could spend time on looking at qualities like validity or rigor, reliability, fair and unbiased questions that make quality assessments. I'm going to recommend that at least you become familiar with something that I think you'll really enjoy learning more about. It's called Webb's DOK, DOK means depth of knowledge chart. It's easily accessible online. Just Google Webb's DOK chart and it will come up. It's very bloomsy. It, it focuses on four levels of questioning strategies, which are critical in domain three around instruction. Questioning and assessment are critical. Moving from questions that ask students to recall facts, those that ask them to uh, define skills or concepts, to real strategic thinking and extended thinking. Web DOK chart gives you kind of a graphic organizer with question stems to help your teachers learn starter words and phrases to raise the level of their questions to more cognitively challenging ones. So if we look at um, Webb's DOK chart, we'll see four kinds of questions. I would invite you, uh, if you have some time afterwards, this is a really great video that helps explain um, how to support teachers in writing questions that really challenge critical thinking. And it's just a great video to use uh, you know, for your own learning and for that of your teachers around the web's chart. Once again, um, it focuses on question stems, recall kinds of questions, what is the formula for? Concept, how is something similar or different? How would you classify it? Moving on to strategic thinking, can you predict the outcome? What conclusion can you draw? How would you test for this? Now, I probably, I, I think that you're probably really sparking right now if you're thinking of CTE instruction that you're most familiar with and how teachers bring students skillfully out of that recall and skill and concept kind of question, which are necessary, but bring them up into that all-important strategic thinking and extended thinking where we're asking kids to draw conclusions we're asking them to perhaps to think of new ways for doing uh, something that they have learned how to do. So once again, this is more like an extension activity for you and your teachers, but it is perfect for CTE instruction. And absolutely, um, I think of the highest relevance for all instruction in terms of giving teachers a great resource to actually promote that evidence of a high level of cognition that we're looking for. So if we're focusing on using questioning prompts and discussions, we can see um, the difference in how we define proficient and distinguished performance. But once again, we, we most firmly land on those actual examples. So 
back to that culinary arts teacher, if we're thinking about questioning and assessments, uh, he structures questions that make students use information to solve a new problem. Here's what it looks like. This is a great example. His students have learned the minimum internal temperature for various meats. They've learned when uh, pork is cooked, what's the temperature? When is veal cooked? When is beef cooked? Well, guys, now we're making a meatloaf. How are we going to know, based on what we already know for internal temperatures, when that meatloaf is cooked? It really is putting A, B, and C together to equal D, and it's really asking students to do the thinking to get to that answer. That's a great example. How about cosmetology, Steph? Yep, compare the swatch colored with 4N and 20 volume to the swatch colored with 4N and 40 volume developer which is closer to the desired outcome and why. So once again, this teacher is not just giving them the information. This teacher is making, making these students think uh, on their feet like they're going to have to do in the real world, in the um, world of cosmetology that they will enter when they have a job. Okay, They're going to have to be thinking about putting the information that they're learning together to solve problems. And that really is key to student-centered instruction. It's key to that cognitive engagement that we keep coming back to. In a physics class, a question might be, how do we measure the muzzle speed of a launcher? How, then, not only how do we measure it, how do we apply that information to choose the correct angle so that the launched ball lands in a cup in a specific distance? That's a very high level of learning. It would probably be back on our web chart, um, a level four question, because once again, we're asking students to put information in, together in a new way to solve a new problem. And that's evidence of certainly proficient and distinguished performance in this domain area in the Danielson framework. We're thinking and we're talking a lot today about engaging students in learning, engaging them cognitively in their learning. We can see and we can take the time to read the nuanced differences between um, most students being cognitively involved and virtually all students being intellectually engaged. So you can go back and kind of savor some of the finer points of the language. But once again, we really want to hone in on those examples. So in emotions graphics class, uh, what's the evidence there? Well, we're going to ask students to link instruction to a recent animation example, or to compare their project to a classic animation film cartoon or character. Once again, it's not just create your animation project, and it's not just, uh, you know, let's take a test about some classic information. This is putting learning to work in application and relevance. This is key in the Danielson rubric. It's key to cognitive engagement, and I'm going to say it's key to Common Core, but that's for another day. Jeff? Yeah. Students prepare a presentation in which they relate similarities and differences between artist Janet Fish's glassware paintings and their artistic composition. In a CNA Core, students are role-playing a conversation between the supervisor and the care provider in a nursing home over a real safety issue that occurred. Once again, the focus is on application and relevance. And then again, over the course of a year, students develop capstone activity, which is year-end fashion show. Right. And you know, from all accounts, that year-end fashion show really does uh, get all students very actively engaged in their own learning. And it results in a beautiful product that everyone acknowledges is just a great thing for their school. In domain 3 and D, we're looking at using assessment and instruction, once again, yes. We can see subtle differences in the descriptors. Um, some examples from a forestry class, uh, students had to design a felling plan for a tree using hazards, obstacle plan, or procedure equipment, HOPE. Uh, students then assess and critique the felling plans of other crews. So they're creating something new, they're designing a plan, they're assessing, and they're critiquing. Once again, the emphasis is on a much higher level of cognition and application. And this is the heart of the Danielson framework. Again, and the understanding of core content of a lesson uh, is demonstrated by Twitter as an exit slip. 
student has an index card and may use 140 characters to tweet response to exit question. In, uh, back in our culinary arts class, uh, this is actually a baking class, um, students have uh, kind of a way to test whether dough is done or not. So they use something that I think is pretty cute called the belly button test to see how the um, gluten is developing when preparing bread dough. So these are ways that students are kind of assessing success with their actions uh, within that classroom food lab. And finally, in domain four, we ask students to think of themselves as those professionals who have such um, a wide spectrum of other responsibilities within their school day to support their own professional growth, hopefully to share professional growth with their colleagues, and to just kind of continue to be um, reflective practitioners who are always moving toward higher levels of performance, whether that is uh, proficient or distinguished. Those professional responsibilities can take many forms. Uh, once again, it's another good conversation in terms of what some evidence might be around them. So these are some examples that could be helpful to you if you're looking for examples that really do um, enhance our understanding of domain four, professional responsibilities. What I would invite you, what we would invite you to do as we wrap up our webinar today is uh, kind of back at the ranch when everybody's back in school, uh, perhaps set people up with partners, have them work together to think of those real examples of proficient or distinguished performance with regard to some of the topics that we've talked about today and how those topics look in their own classroom. Put people together to give and share specific examples of proficient or distinguished um, components within each of the domains that we've talked about, like some of the examples that we've thought of today, but also you know, your folks will come up with many examples of their own. So certainly um, the, the Danielson rubric can be used as a tool in professional practice, really the central example of um, the cookbook for professional growth. Hopefully what we happen, what we hope to see happen is for teachers of CTE uh, classes to see the rubric as a key that really resonates with them as their primary opportunity to learn and to, once again, continually grow in their own practice and take responsibility to feel more ownership uh, and empowerment over their own professional growth. Steph? You might uh, take the opportunity when you go back to your schools and your buildings once again to ask your teachers to write what we can call an elevator speech, kind of a quick 60 second talk to one another that summarizes some of the priorities of the Danielson framework and also examples from their CTE classrooms that they can share with one another. Yeah? Well, good luck and thank you very much for uh, participating, uh, well actually for hearing us out this afternoon. Um, I think there was a lot of information that was shared. We hope that some of it will be helpful to you as you uh, work with your teachers on your APPR. Um, and thanks for your time. Thank you so much. And Gretchen, if there are any other questions from the group, we'd be happy to hear them now. We do not have any questions. OK. All so right. I would like to thank you for joining us for today's webinar. As a reminder, this webinar will be available for viewing at nyctecenter.org within 72 hours. Thank you so much today.